G'day everyone and welcome to this session which is all about social and emotional learning. Why this seems to be newly important for more people right now. What are the benefits for life, for learning, for work and what are the approaches which research and evidence seem to suggest are, are most effective right at the moment. So I'm Mark Spavel, I'm a education leader in Microsoft and I've been involved as a teacher and as a school leader for over 30 years. I've always been interested in this intersection between best practice and next practice. And I've been intrigued by the role that technology can play when levered thoughtfully to humanize the learning and, and not just to digitize curriculum content. And obviously, as an educator, we know that school and learning is an emotional roller coaster. So I've been interested for decades in how emotional intelligence unlocks innovation and potential for individuals and also organisations. You can see from the slide that Microsoft Education's commitment to social and emotional learning stretches back to our education transformation framework. This is a framework used to drive improvement at institution levels and also system levels. And right back in 2012, it identified social and emotional learning, those personal capabilities, as being critical, part of the engine house for driving transformation. And then as you can see, as the timeline progresses up through to today, we've been committed to researching, to developing programs, and indeed even product improvements, which support schools and systems in pursuing the important agenda of social and emotional learning. So how are you feeling today? Now, there's this heightened need for the development of social and emotional skills, both to maximize the potential that learners have and also to inoculate against, or if you like, reduce the negative impacts experienced when faced with complexity, with challenge, and indeed with stress, which sounds a lot like 2020, doesn't it? There's decades and decades, over 20 years of rigorous global research to back this up. Um, so how are you feeling? Let's use an emotion check-in right now. You can go to the address on the screen, aka.ms forward slash how are you feeling? Now, inside that link, you're going to find a little snapshot of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence's mood meter. It's a great tool, excuse the blurry picture on the slide at the moment. It's a great tool, it's organized across the x-axis from pleasant emotions through to unpleasant emotions, and then in each quadrant from low energy to high energy. It does a number of things. It recognizes that all emotions matter and have a purpose. And the mood meter helps to do, and an emotional check-in helps to do three things. Number one, is it develops that emotional vocabulary. Life is not good, bad, sad, and I'm not just mad. There's a whole range of different colors of emotions in between, and each of them have got an important purpose and part to play in our lives. Emotional vocabulary can be called also emotional granularity. It's constantly refining and improving our vocabulary. Later on in the slides, you'll see me reference Professor Mark Brackett where he says, you have to name it in order to tame it. The second valuable thing about an emotional check-in with a scaffold like mood meter is it helps to support that ability to be able to accurately identify and label emotions. And when we can do that in ourselves, we're more likely to be able to do that for others, to become, as Professor Brackett says, more of an emotion detective and less of an emotion judge. And the third benefit here is it invites emotion in the moment, uh, into the learning program or into an engagement. It gives you a pause and a chance to think about how your emotions are impacted by internal and external factors and how they shift and change over time. Emotion literally means to be in motion and they all have a purpose. I'll share the summary of your emotional check-in sometime after the session. So there's a number of ways that social and emotional learning can happen. It ranges from prescriptive programs where there might be a set progression of lesson plans and uh, approaches, 
all the way through to whole school or indeed whole system approaches which place well-being at the center of all that they do. A number of our most successful global um, national curriculums place social and emotional skills as very intentional targets at national curriculum levels. And it's really interesting when you look at how well those systems perform. And technology can play a role here too in the development of social and emotional skills. A great paper by the World Economic Forum is called New Vision for Education, Fostering Social and Emotional Skills Through Technology. And it provides a number of examples of how technology can potentially play a critical role in improving education in the future. But one thing is clear from the research and that's the role of teachers and leaders and parents are critical in modeling approaches and skills, making sure that they're intentional and they're not accidental. And importantly, inviting and recognizing social and emotional skills as being fundamental and they're not ornamental parts of success. And this includes how we assess and report because we know in education, we value, if you like, we treasure what we measure. So it's important that, um, that we're both teaching and also we're accurately assessing, measuring and reporting social and emotional skill development. So what are the social and emotional skills that we talk about? The Collaborative, um, Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, uh, in the US has identified five competencies, which sitting beneath those, if you like, are specific social and emotional skills. Um, let's have a, a, a dip into each of these. One of these self-awareness, you can see that at the bottom, that's the ability to recognize your emotions and understand the links between emotions, thoughts, and behavior. And a little bit later, you'll hear me talking about emotions as being the gatekeeper. Self-management, that's the ability to regulate emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. Uh, this is the name it to tame it piece, if you like, which doesn't mean deny it, ignore it, or suppress it. It means recognize it um, and be able to regulate it. Let's look at another one, relationship skills. These are the ability to initiate, to sustain, build and maintain healthy relationships. And critically, these social and emotional skills really are nice, but if they don't drive behavior, then they're not adding their greatest value. So the ability to make responsible and ethical decisions, good choices about your behavior and your interactions with other are a critical competency sitting here. So collectively, the skills that underpin these capabilities, they help us to navigate our social and emotional world. They directly influence how we build, sustain relationships, how we make decisions which are ethical, responsible, and they provide us with tools and insights that help us to manage ourselves and to navigate others in work, in life, and in learning. So the big why, I mean, all of this sounds good, but why? Social and emotional learning approaches offer a host of benefits that stretch out across a lifetime. And there's amazing empirical research which stretches up to 18 to 20 years of a person's lifetime. It's imperative right now for today's youngest generation who require a wide ranging set of social and emotional abilities to prepare them for the demands of a rapidly changing workplace, to position them to achieve success academically and other, and to equip them to be able to contribute and help shape a preferred future. So when we think about in education um, and build a case, if you like, for social and emotional learning, these are critical because they derive our behavior and it also helps us to direct our, our most limited and our greatest resource, which is our attention. And when I said earlier, emotions are the gatekeeper of attention, cognition, and motivation, how where we direct our focus, 
how we process information about the world around us and how we sustain and maintain our motivation and our drive. And it's interesting that in our latest survey results, which will be released um, in January, February, one of the, the greatest challenges educators have noted across 2020 was not technology, but it was student motivation. The Aspen Institute released a really important paper in January 2020, which was focused around social and emotional learning and academic development. In a sense, placing these like strands of DNA. If you're interested in content and knowledge, you have to be equally interested in social and emotional development um, in order to drive that acquisition of content and also the use of it. So. The evidence around long-term benefits are extensive. Um, let's just touch on some of those benefits. Number one, promotes mental well-being. Um, you can also drive significant improvement in attitudes towards self and others. Let's look at a few more da data points. We can reduce depression, coming up some information on that from the World Health Organization. Improvement in standardized tests improvement in social and emotional skills and reduction in um, behaviours which are non-productive um, behaviours. That education attainment one is a really interesting one. Students with who have had an exposure to social and emotional learning programs scored 13 points higher than their peers three and a half years later when measured and validated. Here are some other interesting stat points. If we take that emotions are the gatekeeper to cognition, attention and motivation, essential for learning basically, consider this um, data point from the top. This has been published in the, um, uh, from Castle. Uh, research undertaken by Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation in collaboration with the Yale Centre for Emotional Intelligence asked thousands and thousands of high school students how they felt and 75% of the words used how they feel at school were negative. The most commonly reported words were tired, bored, and stressed. If emotions are the gatekeeper to cognition, attention, and motivation, and 75% of students feel tired, bored, and stressed, how can we hope to achieve academic outcomes without addressing the social and emotional learning dimension? Others just here, increase in uh, high school graduation rates, post-secondary enrollment, post-secondary completion, employment rates, even wages, tied to high social and emotional competency. And of course, decreases in dropout rates, behavior issues, at-risk behaviors, are all correlated with high social and emotional competency. So the summary, I guess, here would be in this heightened state and need that we have at the moment, a focus on social and emotional learning can maximise learner potential and can minimise or inoculate against the debilitating stresses, the, what we're faced with, complexity, ambiguity, change and stress. So if we think about this blast zone of 2020 with, with COVID, and we think about that uncertainty. It was a humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, um, a health crisis, all with education placed firmly in the centre. And the ripple effect of that will roll out over two or three years. It's not finished at 2020. Those at greatest risk will be those who have got the lowest access to social and emotional learning programs. Now, before the events of 2020 though, um, you know, there was this increasing global demand for social and emotional skills in the workplace and in schools. Think about this, the World Health Organization identified depression as the number one disability, literally disabling people from living their life to their full potential, their economic and their personal lives. Um, there are some suggestions of impacts of cost to the employment sector in the US alone through direct and indirect interventions around mental health issues, placing that around $210 billion a year. And for students, depression, 
anxiety steadily increasing. This is based on CDC data for young people. In the US, estimates that as many as one out of five children experience a mental disorder in any given year. Again, if you looked at this, not just with a personal cost or a community cost, but at an economic cost, $247 billion each year is spent on treatment and management of childhood mental disorders. And that's not just in the US. In the UK, 20% of adolescents may experience a mental health problem in any given year. 50% of mental health problems are established by age 14, 75% by age 24. And 70% of children and adolescents who experience mental health problems and challenges have not had appropriate interventions at a sufficiently early age. Let's elevate this up a click. There's a lot of talk and conversation around the sustainable development goals. And this I think is really interesting to bring social and emotional learning and this SDGs together. The Mahatma Gandhi Institute for the Education of Peace and Sustainability focused some studies around why social and emotional learning is necessary to achieve the sustainable development goals. And this is to do with the conflicting goals within the sustainable development goals and how the attainment of these goals may necessitate this balancing act, the need to balance between individuals, social collectives, and even economic imperatives. And the study suggested that two avenues, emotional resilience and pro-social behaviors can help manage the tension and attainment of the SDGs. Want to achieve the sustainable development goals? Must focus on social and emotional skills. Interesting, right? And of course, that leads to this great benefit of a focus on social and emotional skills, which is promoting social cohesion through empathy, through understanding, through kindness, through gratitude, through collaboration. Our challenges are shared challenges globally. Our solutions are shared solutions too. Let's have a chat about the future of work, which the future of work is now, I think. Um, six out of 10 of the skills identified by the World Economic Forum um, were social and emotional competency, six out of 10 in terms of what employers wanted. And 92% of executives surveyed said that skills such as the ability to get along, to solve problems, to work independently, um, and to communicate clearly and thoughtfully are equal to or more important than technical skills. If we consider what are the new future ready skills for some research undertaken and published by McKinsey and Company's Global Institute in April 2020, here's what we notice about decreasing and increasing between 2016 and 2020. So physical routine manual skills decreasing as automation and AI picks up those roles basic cognitive skills similar. Where we see the increase is these higher cognitive skills, these are the things that humans do well, synthesize, abstract, ideate, create, analyze, synthesize. Here's an interesting one, social and emotional skills. Look at that, 24, huge jump in uh, the total hours worked estimates. And not surprisingly, technological skills. You know, these technical skills for the digital economy um, a huge demand. In the past, when we've talked about future ready skills, I think we've largely talked about technical skills for the digital economy. I think the new view of future ready skills is the intersection between those technical skills, those social and emotional skills and the higher cognitive skills. I think this is where we see human machine collaboration operating at its most sort of greatest potential, the best of humans and what we bring with the best of technology, what it can bring. Here's another interesting piece as we wind our way back from the world of work, back to the world of schooling. Let's talk about the missing skills. So HR professionals were asked about missing skills in the workforce right now in a workforce becoming increasingly automated. And look at these skills here they make a lot of sense as ones being missed. But guess what? That's not what that list is. That list I've just put on the screen is from the Education Endowment Fund in the UK, which undertook a study to work out what were the skills 
and the competencies that young people possessed, which allowed them to experience success across 2020 with the push to remote learning, then the move to hybrid learning. These were the skills that allowed young people to succeed against a backdrop of complexity, ambiguity and change. But you're asking, what was it that HR professionals want right now from employees? Here's what they want. They want problem solving. They want the ability to deal with complexity, ambiguity, and they want clarity of communication skills. When you look at those lists against one another, probably like me, you go, oh, that's interesting. The very skills which allowed young people to succeed across 2020 against a backdrop of great change and complexity and sort of a, a pressure to become more self-aware, self-regulate at greater levels, to work more independently, to persist, to be patient, to communicate and collaborate in new modalities are exactly what the world of work needs right now. So that brings us sweetly back to a return to school, which clearly has a significant function, not just to do this, not just to prevent and address mental health issues or to minimise the impact of them, but to maximise the potential that learners have collectively to do good, feel good, do good and be good. So let's just consider where does the supply come and are there challenges there? So, you know, we noted in our own research undertaken with um, the Economist Intelligence Unit, Emotion, Cognition and the Age of AI, that globally there was this high demand and low supply for social and emotional learning approaches. And there was a number of reasons for those. But consider the supply side. One of the significant challenges here, and we note teacher preparation, curriculum, and also the measurement are key pieces of the supply chain. One of the big challenges is to do with educators. The attracting, retaining and developing of skilled educators globally is a major challenge with UNESCO predicting by 2030, 69 million additional teachers will be required. But consider the backdrop that by the end of their fourth year out, young career teachers, 40% are thinking of leaving the profession and 10% have already decided to leave. And the reasons aren't necessarily what happens in the classroom. It's what happens in the staff room. It's the social and emotional context that uh, ultimately drives good teachers out of the profession. So we know these things are important for work, for life, for learning. And we also know that to develop them, and there's probably, I mean, there's a lot of things, but let's call out five things. One of them you can see on the screen at the moment is number one, we need to develop an emotional vocabulary. I called that granularity earlier on. Think about this. Uh, a young child learns around up to 5,000 new words a year. 10% of those come from direct instruction, like in a, in a classroom. The rest come through their use. And number two, we must provide opportunities to label and express emotion. So number one, develop an emotional vocabulary. Number two, provide opportunities to use that vocabulary to label and to express. Number three, we must provide feedback on social and emotional skills in all modalities. In fact, students said that in the class of 2030 research, 70% of students said they felt they weren't getting enough feedback and they called out social and emotional skills as an area of greatest need and lack. Number four, students need opportunities to practice in the real world, in life between the screens or life within the screens in an immersive game. And five is they need opportunities to observe. So they need chances to see others engaging and using social and emotional skills, particularly significant adults, teachers, leaders. This is where school culture is so critical. 
Here's a few other exciting places to go to to find out a lot more information. Consider this session to be both an introduction to what Microsoft is doing and thinking around social and emotional learning and an invitation to follow up. So on the screen, some of the examples of coursework, which is in the Microsoft Education Center. Some of it's created by Microsoft. Some of it's created by great partners like Headspace, like WeSchools. Uh, there's collections of resources. There are communities of practice on Facebook, the Cell and Edu group that Microsoft supports, plus their collection of great top 10 ideas for Cell in the Classroom, uh, which you can take and use and share. Other cool places to go, our resource page, uh, all around social and emotional learning. So you'll find examples of check-ins that you can use using Microsoft Forms, plus links to things like the Mind Up webinar series, our partnership with Goldie Horns Foundation to support mindfulness. And of course, it's important that everything is grounded in evidence and research. You can grab the research used in today's presentation on the links on the screen there, or join us at the Microsoft Education Center for more information about approaches to learning design with a focus on social and emotional skills. And that's it from me. So I'm looking forward to engaging with you further across 2021. Thank you for everything that you do each and every day to empower every learner on the planet to achieve more.